<laughs> Thank you, Fergus. And hi, everyone, and a warm, warm welcome to this truly global and also truly hybrid webinar that takes place uh, in person here in Stockholm, in person in Nairobi, and then with many, many participants joining us online. So a warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Marie Gerso and I'm Operations Director at SEI and on behalf of SEI, just to say welcome, we are very happy to co-host this event with Siani, with C4 eCraft, with SLU and UNEP. The topic of this event, uh, talking about food systems transformations and the role for agroecology, is of course extremely topical. <clears throat> uh, I think the need for uh, bottom-up territorial and contextualized solutions to local problems has never been as important perhaps as it is today uh, in wake of the geopolitical situations that we find ourselves in. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to learning from the speakers uh, today. This is, of course, also an associated event with Stockholm Plus <clears throat> 50, uh, the large global international uh, conference that is taking place in Stockholm this week. Uh, the focus of this conference is of, on dialogue, on high level political dialogue, on sharing experiences and also building momentum <clears throat> for even more action going forward. So I hope that our associated event here today will serve as a good inspiration to uh, all the people meeting further south in Stockholm later this week. Um, so with that, back over to Fergus to introduce our speakers. And a warm welcome again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and it's um, wonderful that we've got uh, nearly 900 uh, people listening in online. Um, uh, and uh, people in person um, in Nairobi and uh, Stockholm. Um, could I have the first slide? Sure, coming up. So the context um, of this, uh, just go to the second slide. <laughs> The context of uh, the discussions that we're going to have today are around four interacting global challenges, three of which have UN conventions. Uh, that's biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and uh, land degradation. And uh, the fourth broken food systems is um, uh, uh, obviously uh, critically dealt with by uh, the Committee on World Food Security. And the key issue that we want to explore is the extent to which agroecology uh, can contribute to integrated ways of addressing these um, constraints, with the, the, which these crises, which need a systemic response because they're interconnected. Next slide. And there is a sort of missing middle, if you like, between the international um, and national commitments, whether it's AFR 100 to land restoration, uh, commitments to, to the Aichi targets, commitments to um, uh, a whole host um, uh, of really desirable outcomes, but translating that to action on the ground where things are integrated in terms of farmer practice uh, is critical. And uh, as we get closer to the farmer, the need to integrate across sectors becomes uh, more critical. Next slide. The transformative partnership platform on agroecology was uh, launched um, at CFS 48 last year, um, uh, where the um, uh, coming from the high-level panel of experts report from uh, CFS on agroecological and other innovative approaches um, to uh, global food security. 
Um, and it's a partnership that has uh, brought in many different actors um, that are interested in uh, addressing the knowledge and implementation gaps that constrain widespread adoption um, of agroecology. Next slide. At UNFSS, the United Nations Food Systems Summit uh, last year, um, uh, the coalition to transform food systems through uh, agroecology um, was uh, launched and, and began to emerge. And that was quite um, a main outcome of UNFSS and perhaps a surprising one because um, in the lead up to UNFSS, agroecology wasn't even on the program. Because of some pressure from uh, member states, uh, a session was shoehorned into the pre-summit. It was extremely well attended um, and that led ultimately to the, the coalition emerging. Next slide. And it now has um, 33 countries, including the European Union and the African Union as members, and 61 uh, organizations, including um, uh, key UN organizations, civil society organizations, research organizations, a very broad uh, uh, coalition of actors. And it is uh, a coalition uh, of action. Next slide. Um, and, and it's a coalition of the willing. And that is quite important because it means not everybody in, in, in uh, 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 across countries has to agree on everything in order for action to happen. Um, and getting uh, people to act um, so that uh, other countries and other organizations can uh, join in as momentum builds uh, is proving very powerful. There are five working groups in the coalition, uh, and this um, uh, meeting was organized through the Research and Innovation Working Group. Next slide. Thank you. So this session is divided into three sections. We start with a framing, uh, and then we move um, um, through to look at integrated policies and their implementation. And then our final section is on farmers as natural system integrators. Uh, and then we'll have our, our final discussion and a poll on implementation challenges through Slido. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first uh, panelist, Pat Mooney um, from IPS Food. Um, um, and uh, we're really uh, pleased to have uh, Pat starting our uh, session because there have been a couple of reports uh, coming out of IPS, the most recent um, uh, called The Perfect Storm, that are really relevant to um, uh, the framing of this discussion around these interconnected um, uh, global challenges and how to tackle them. Pat. Well, thank you very much, Fergus. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is it loud enough for? <clears throat> yes. Hope? Thank you. Okay, good. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that you, Fergus, mentioned at the beginning the, the importance of the role of the Committee on World Food Security uh, and the role it's played in supporting agroecology. I think it has been a critical body that that's, uh, is, is uh, still the key sort of policy forming body in, in the United Nations system, the multilateral community, to understand these issues and to move us ahead. And it's a body which has, uh, I think, more than any other, reached out to the, the other actors coming out of the, of the real conference in, uh, in 30 years ago now, uh, that uh, tried to bring together the concerns about, recognizes the issues around climate, around biodiversity loss, around soil degradation, uh, the need for the for broad cooperation among systems to to work together to to solve these problems. Uh, the two reports that that IPIS Food has been involved in uh, that relate to this, I think uh, you mentioned one, which is a, an imperfect storm, which we brought out at the beginning of May, uh, which uh, tried to again look at uh, this 
uh, coalition of, of, of uh, unfortunately disasters that have come together in the last uh, short while, uh, actually all of this century, but especially in the last few months, we've been aware of it as we see what's happening to the planet, uh, the so-called uh, uh, people have called black swan events uh, that who would have expected a war in Europe, who would have expected uh, uh, that to come together, the time of massive uh, famine in Africa with, with such terrible lack of rain in the world. Uh, these kinds of problems in the middle of a pandemic at the same time, all these things have come together and uh, uh, it's, it's created an imperfect storm. And how do we respond to that? Uh, it brings together the challenges of climate change with biodiversity loss and, and the food crests all together <clears throat> in place. And that's been important. We also had done a report last year, which was uh, looking at our long food movement, the need uh, uh, to try to understand uh, how we get ourselves from where we are uh, to plan far enough ahead to do enough sort of horizon scanning uh, looking at the scope of the events that are taking place, that means looking at on the horizon, looking at the other kinds of crises, the other kinds of so-called black swans that are out there that, that uh, we're going to have to address. And uh, we that, that work really concluded that we need to have two things. We need to have a long-term strategy and we need to have the capacity to, to strengthen territorial markets, to strengthen local uh, food systems. Uh, to survive the, the decades ahead of us. And perhaps the, the thing that brought the two reports we've done together, and I think it was important to this conversation, is that we came to understand in the course of the research of the, in the panel uh, that there aren't black swans. That in fact, they're just gray swans. That these are things that we know are out there. They're not a surprise to us. We shouldn't be surprised by the fact that that we have a climate crisis, that's not news to anybody. We shouldn't be surprised by the fact that, that we're facing uh, the political fallout from those kinds of, of, of uh, climate crises. Uh, pandemics are not a surprise to anyone. We're all telling each other now how we should have known this decades ago, and many of us did know these things decades ago. And we know where they're going to happen again. So for us, a gray swan, which we refer to in both reports, are, are again, those things which uh, we can't, understand their parameters entirely. We don't know exactly when they're going to happen. We know they're going to happen. We know we'll be faced with these crises again. Uh, we can debate whether or not we're in our third food crisis of this century or our fourth at this stage, but we've been through a series of them. We actually are living at a time, I would argue, uh, living in a century, which is sort of surrounded by a squadron of gray swans of all kinds. They will circle this century and affect our lives for the rest of this century. And the question for us then is not to simply address them as a food crisis or address them as a climate crisis or as a health crisis, but to understand that they all do fit together. And the responses to, the, to these crises, these gray swan events, is knowing that they're out there, knowing that the, any one of them, whichever one instigates it, whether, whether it is a political crisis uh, in terms of war or as a crisis in terms of a disease, uh, we are still going to find ourselves in a kind of the same situation where they all affect each other, fall upon each other, uh, create a crisis for all of us to deal with together. And how do we do that? And in understanding that, then we end up coming back to the, the key point of, of how do we create from the food side uh, a system which is dealing and strengthening the, the capacity of communities to take care of their own food needs as far as they can and to amalgamate that or link that to the other, the other institutions at the community level that can come together to get us through crises. How do we build the structural basis to allow that to happen? How do we find the political space at the global level to allow that to happen? How do we address the, everyone from the WTO to WHO to make it viable, to, to make communities more viable, to get us through this century of, of gray swans? And that has become for us a, a critical conversation around uh, what we've learned about uh, supply chains in the course of, of uh, these last few months and few, few years with the pandemic, how we've understood more and more that these complex supply chains that we had uh, work very well sometimes and work terribly other times. And they don't work well at all usually for those who are in a food crisis. Uh, it's not a matter of simply waiting for a semiconductor to show up. It's a matter of trying to get food on the table. 
but even the semiconductor failures can affect the ability to get food on the table. And so how do we then create the political space to do the things we need to do to create more food viability at, again, local levels around the world? And that's a real challenge for us. And one of the conclusions that we came up with in, in the, the long food movement report, and we refer to it again in, in the imperfect storm, is the, the need to look at legal structures that would create a change of environment, a legal environment around uh, any crisis. The legal structure that allows us to say, okay, in this context, we need to have a, a, a change in the rules of the game when there is, for example, the, if we start just with the food side of the crisis, how do we suspend, for example, intellectual property law to allow for access to whatever seeds or whatever other materials, including farm machinery and repairs of those machinery that we need to get through the, this crisis? How do we suspend land tenure arrangements and land, so-called land grabs arrangements in such a way that local people get access to the land they need to grow local food? rather than have seen food exported or land not being used at all. How do we uh, suspend uh, or address at least the crisis around debt, which is a huge problem for many countries now, and to, to not be forced into it, now put, pay more in debt servicing than we've been able to pay in some countries for, to, to survive the social crisis of the pandemic. How do we, get, how do we say, no, those rules, that, that regime of relationships has to end, we have to have an emergency legislation environment in which food is at the center of, this, of the solution. And whether it's, again, intellectual property rights or it's land or it's uh, uh, any other sort of financial arrangements, uh, how do we change that, that structure to allow people to, eat, to feed themselves? And how do we create the environment where we have still a, a globalization of knowledge? How can we, in, in this crisis, uh, in multiple crises ahead of us, how can we make sure that while we can support as much local uh, development as possible, as much local food production as possible, and, and uh, access to that food, how can we do that in a way where we still have access to the information we need to have to help each other? And that's absolutely critical in terms of, the, of these decades ahead. We look at just the area of seeds, which is an area that I've been more familiar with. How can we ensure ourselves that farmers working with other farmers and farmers organizations around the world get access to the seeds they need in an era of climate change? How do we use agroecological uh, strategies to ensure that the gene banks of the world are available to the farmers of the world to do the experimentation they need to do themselves to make sure that they, they can grow the food they need to have? How do they switch crops if they need to? How do they adjust to new climatic conditions and new disease conditions and share with other farmers the information they need to have to, to be able to to get food on the table again and produce that food, of course. These to us are, are critical questions of, uh, we need to think now about creating not only at the, at the local level legislation, at the national level legislation, and at the international level, a treaty that around food emergencies that will ensure the right of people to right to food at the local level for the communities and create an environment of what, of course, we call in the Committee on Food Security, food sovereignty. To us, that's, that's uh, the, the task ahead of us. These are, of course, ridiculously difficult challenges we're facing. The gray swans that we're facing are, are uh, dangerous and, and uh, again, not entirely predictable. Uh, but in the, in the kind of structural changes we need to make are complex ones, which, which are not going to be easy to achieve, but which we have to start working on now in order to make sure we can survive in the decades ahead. So there are difficult, daunting political challenges. Trying to address the issue of intellectual property rights, for example, is just absolutely almost impossible, it would seem, although it's been nice to see that the United States government, at least in the context of, uh, of pharmaceuticals or access to medicines, is starting to make changes. How do we change the environment in terms of trade and understanding the, the flows of food? We discovered in the course of, of the pandemic and now with, with the, you see the crisis with the war in Ukraine, uh, the need for more transparency uh, in the corporations, the grain trading companies, the ABCs and Ds of the world who are still holding too much information that's not being allowed access for others 
We, we don't, can't get access to that information. We don't know who's got what food reserves exactly where in the world. How do we change that transparency, which is not we've promised ourselves to do since, since the 2007 2008 crisis in food? And we still haven't done enough to make that system transparent. We still don't know enough about our own food supply chain. We've got to change the rules of the game around that. It was nice to read in the paper today, for example, in the, in the uh, uh, Financial Times the report that BlackRock, mm -hmm. uh, as the world's largest asset management company, with investments in every single agribusiness anyone can name, need to name in the private sector, BlackRock has said now they're going to be more transparent. Well, that's what that means in real terms. Finally, we'll wait and see. But with ten trillion dollars in assets, that's an important issue. How do we make sure that Cargill is going to be transparent? Uh, how do we address those companies and challenge them to, to do their job of keeping us informed as to what's happening to, to our food supplies? How do we make sure that, again, back to local communities, how do those local communities do the job they need to do and get the information they need to have to, to uh, again, get through these crises? So it's a complex series of issues. It's, I think for us, it's important to think about the immediate needs and the immediate steps we need to take to, to uh, uh, strengthen agroecology at the local level, that's critical. But we also, in the, in the struggle to achieve those short-term needs, we need to be aware of the long-term goals we have to have to get us through this century. And those are long-term political changes, uh, governance changes, which, which, which uh, we have not addressed in the past. We've had through, again, three or four food crises so far in this century, and we have much more to face in the, in the decades ahead. So we should do that now. I should especially say, though, that in all of this and looking at ways in which we can have uh, uh, local support for agroecology and strengthen our food production at the local level. At the same time that is going on, we're seeing a centralization strategy going in, in terms of agricultural research. And that alarms me. I think many of us are, are just becoming aware of the fact that the, the consultative group on international agricultural research uh, as what was once 15 different independent institutions are cooperating together to provide, I think, a debatable level of agricultural research, but still a, a useful public sector research initiative. How is it that we're seeing that all suddenly being centralized? <clears throat> suddenly the government structure of these separate institutions responding to their own conditions in their own host countries and in their own regions of the world and, and cooperating with each other, I think, quite successfully often. How do we actually... Uh, allow them to move ahead and be centralized in some way that, that uh, really denies local communities, denies national governments of uh, access to the governance of those, of those uh, institutions. It's a, to me, is an absolute reversal of what we should be seeing in the plant today. We should be seeing, in fact, the 15 centers of the CG system cooperating more closely with the Committee on World Food Security. And uh, building into that, the, the social understandings of the Committee on World Food Security and the governance concerns that they have, uh, and tying that to, to the scientific research that we need to have uh, from the public sector. So I want to highlight that, in my mind at least, as one area which, which has not been debated in the international community, where major changes are taking place in the most important public sector agricultural research we have uh, on the planet. And uh, this again going on without any discussion by anybody. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a serious worry we should be discussing. Two minutes, Pat. Um, I thought I'd run out. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I address these areas then. Let me just go back and, and highlight what we've discovered in our work. One again is the need for local to global treaties or, or legislation that allow for emergency rules just come into play and which then change it allow for the changes in terms of land tenure uh, financial arrangements uh, uh, export import arrangements and so on uh, in, in support for local production uh, secondly we need to have a system of international agricultural research where farmers are at the center of that research who will, are going to need to have to fundamentally change what they grow and how they grow it and need to work with other farmers to, to share experiences as, 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 as cl the climate shifts and as pests and diseases shift and as crops are going to shift, how they can cooperate together uh, and to work with the public sector research community to, to get us to a safer place. We need to go back and look at the promises we made to each other in 2007, 2008, and again in 10, 2010, 2012, and again uh, with the beginning of the pandemic uh, to, to be clear about 
uh, what as, as, as governments we will do to ensure more transparency in the food chain so we can really understand what's happening to our system. It's simply irresponsible that we live in a world where four companies can tell us uh, what they want to tell us about the food system. And we can guess that maybe they have 70% or maybe it's 90% of the international trade in, in, commodity, in agricultural commodities. We can't be sure. That's unacceptable. And uh, that's the task we have before us. Let me leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Pat, and you've, you've put a lot on the table there. Um, and we're going to have a, um, a, our first sort of uh, discussion session after we hear from Laura Scandura, um, president of the uh, Catier Board of Directors, the uh, Agricultural Research Institute in um, Central America. Um, and uh, we're very lucky uh, to have you, Laura. You've been a a champion um, of advancing real solutions to complex challenges. Um, so we're, we're really excited to hear from you. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have a presentation up? There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Very pleased to be here and participate in the panel discussion. Today, what I'd like to do is um, set the stage for our conversation by sharing a few highlights of Katia's work on transforming food systems in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially as it relates to building resilience to climate change, reversing biodiversity loss, increasing food and nutrition security, and also building inclusive and sustainable development. And this is important work because, as we all know, biodiversity loss is accelerating around the world, and uh, the global food system is the primary driver of that. Our food system has been shaped over the past decades by this cheaper food paradigm with our policies and our economic structure really aimed at producing as much food as possible at the lowest possible cost. And that's had some a negative impact. It's degraded our soils, our ecosystems, and has contributed to GHG emissions. So without reform of that system, without reform of our food system, bio, biodiversity loss is going to continue to accelerate and literally threaten our ability to produce enough food for a growing population. So the question for us is, if we want to sustainably nourish a growing population, how can we transform our food systems for climate resilience, sustainability, and community well-being, while producing food in a way that really recognizes that interconnection between people, animals, plants, and our shared environment? And then more specifically, what role does agroecology agro play? Next slide, please. So if you're not familiar with Katia, I'd like to share just a little bit by way of uh, background. It's the old, oldest graduate school in Latin America uh, dedicated to tropical agriculture. Based in Costa, Costa Rica, Katia has been focused on that nexus of uh, sustainable agriculture, natural resource management and equitable and inclusive communities for nearly 50 years. So that really gives Katia a unique perspective and some insights into what works. And next year, 2023 is going to mark our 50th anniversary of putting that combined combination of scientific knowledge and local knowledge into practice. Over the years, Katia has evolved into both a graduate school and also it acts as a regional platform for conducting applied research. So together with its partners, it generates impact by taking that research and through donor-funded development projects and, and technical collaboration. And with its network of 17 member countries, Katia sits at that nexus of the environmental agenda and the agricultural agenda. And, and this is key to bridge the gap between the two. And so Katia also actively works to connect the small landholders communities and marginalized populations to those two agendas, and then also work through its member countries to influence and inform uh, national policy frameworks through evidence-based approaches and applied research. So in this way, this is how Katia drives sustainable, inclusive growth in the region. The next slide, please. I'd like to turn now and just share um, examples of both Katia's resources and its work in agroecological intensification. Next slide. One of the things that Pat mentioned was the importance of seed banks or germplasm banks. 
Well, Cartier's coffee and cacao germplasm banks are world renowned, but we also have um, a seed collection that holds some fairly unique materials that have been collected over decades. And the good news is that some of these materials we think are really quite promising for adaption to extreme weather events and agroecological management. However, you know, without some fairly significant outside funding, it'll be difficult for Cartier to identify the most resilient materials and then work with farmers to figure out which ones have the most um, potential. But all of Cartier's germplasm is in the public domain and it's available to public and private researchers, I think to, at a cost of $13.75 per, uh, per sample. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes uh, Cartier's approach to transforming food systems. And what I'd like to emphasize here is Cartier has a holistic or transdisciplinary approach to promote the practices, policies, tools, innovation, solutions across economic, environmental, and social dimensions of uh, sustainable development. Cartier's approach is participatory, and it's also contextualized to meet the needs of a specific region or local community, with agroecology being a key component. And finally, it does put farmers at the center of research. Next slide, please. Cartier has a host of development projects that focus on the SDG goals, but just in the view of uh, limited time that I have available, I just wanted to highlight two of them to give you a flavor of Cartier's work. So this one is called the Meso, uh, Ag Mesoamerican Agroenvironmental Program, otherwise known as MAP, and it's addressed a host of issues related to poverty, inequality, food and nutrition insecurity, ecosystem degradation and climate change vulner vulnerability in two territories in Central America. And the project um, used a climate smart territories or CST approach, which is something that's been championed by Cartier in part because we found that this really gives people the information that they need to build their capacity, share information and make informed decisions. And through this approach, Kachi worked at three levels, the local level, the territorial level, and the national level. So at the local level, we Kachi focused on things like strengthening the capacities of small producers and their families, promoting agroecological and agroforestry management practices, and also focusing on improving the nutrition, and the food and nutrition of uh, rural families. At the territorial level, the focus was on strengthening uh, business, uh, producer business organizations along value chains. And then at the national level, it was helping to create or inform those enabling policy environments. And across all of this, a cross-cutting issue was gender and youth, and largely strengthening uh, participation of both women and youth in decision-making. The next slide, please. Here you can see just, uh, you can get a sense of some of the results of the MAP program. So if you look at those brightly colored lines, you can see that across the 5,000 or so families that participated in the program, there was an increase in both production and consumption of fruits, vegetables, and cereals, as, as well as improvement in the participation of women in um, household decisions, and then increased resilience to climate change through the uptake of uh, climate smart practices. Next slide, please. I won't go into this in detail, but based on the success of the MAP program, Kathy is working with Sweden to um, scale the MAP approach to uh, additional areas, to additional vulnerable areas, to build resilience to climate change. So we're very much looking forward to that opportunity. Next slide. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Cartier's work in livestock and environmental management, particularly civil pastoral systems, which is something Cartier is known for. So Cartier's work is largely focused on creating a productive yet low carbon livestock sector by once again working with farmers on things like improved pasture management and uh, the uptake of silvo pastoral systems. This is a bottom up approach. But it's also combined with top-down interventions that are designed to create those enabling policy environments. And we think that this is a very impactful way of uh, accelerating sustainable intensification in livestock production. Next slide, please. 
Katia's research has shown that the introduction of civil pastoral systems can increase productivity, reduce grazing area, and increase forest cover, particularly with the introduction of policies like payments for ecosystem services. Next slide. So building on the proven uh, techniques, this approach is being scaled and incorporated into national policies, including uh, a not the non facility in Honduras. And the next slide. Are you drawing to a close now? Um, I am drawing to a close. <laughs> so um, thank you for your attention in, in closing. <laughs> now, I'd like to invite you to partner with Katia to sort of build mo momentum for a more robust discussion and action around how we can accelerate um, food systems transformation through agroecological agro approaches and also the one health doc, uh, paradigm. And there's just some thoughts on that slide in terms of how we can potentially do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and particularly for bringing livestock uh, in. Obviously, many of the agroecological principles um, uh, require integrated livestock crop systems, and it's uh, um, fantastic to see that being um, highlighted. Uh, we now have 10 minutes for discussion. We have um, uh, people asking questions online um, uh, and also um, in, in the room. If you are physically in either Nairobi or Stockholm, please indicate if you want to ask a question. Um, if you uh, do ask a question, please start by telling us who you are um, uh, and, and then um, asking the question. And if it's to a specific panelist, then then, then please indicate that. Um, I'm looking to see whether there are any hands in Nairobi while I'm doing that. Marcos, do you have uh, anybody um, indicating uh, that they want to ask a, a, or make a comment in, uh, in Stockholm? Otherwise, I have got uh, questions online. <laughs> Go ahead, Fergus. We don't have any question from our side at the moment. Okay, so um, let me start. The first question I have um, is uh, to Pat, um, and it relates to the comment about um, uh, changing um, uh, legal frameworks and the need to, to do that in emergencies. Um, the, one of the, the, the key outgoing directors from the European Union recently indicated that there were problems with the food price uh, crisis that's happening now in the rolling back of legislation around things like pesticide usage because people are worried about short-term uh, production. So it seems as though what's happening at the moment may be the opposite of what um, uh, he was suggesting uh, is necessary and the responses to short term crisis uh, seem to be to push longer term uh, 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 requirements uh, into the distance. I don't know whether uh, you, you could address that, Pat. <laughs> I mean, just, uh, yes, I'd love to. It's, it's a classic strategy, unfortunately, when we have a crisis, uh, the, 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 the constant comment is always, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And so we find in a time like this that there are those who, I would say mainly from the fertilizer industry and the agrochemical industry, that see it very advantageous to say, gee, in this crisis, we got to produce all the possible food we can. Uh, whatever we have to do to do that, we will. And we let's jettison agroecology, let's jettison anything which we think is in the production of strategy for the, for, for the immediate time. Uh, even conversations that I've heard uh, coming up in, in Europe and in the United States about the possibility of uh, looking at, well, agriculture has got some, or air, uh, Africa has got some agricultural land that could be utilized more for the rest of the world more beneficially. So maybe we should find ways to exploit that more rapidly than before uh, for the benefit of outside of Africa. Right? That kind of discussion always happens. Naomi Klein called it the shock doctrine effect. And uh, I think we, we, we should be very wary of that. 
Uh, we, in a time of crisis, you don't do that kind of thing. In a time of crisis, what you do is build from the strengths that you've got. What we have around the world is peasant food production or smallholder food production, which is central to food security for about 70% of the people on this planet, uh, especially in, in, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. We don't provide all of the food, but we provide the majority of the food for those people. And we need to build for them in their situation to get us through the crisis. And to decide now that we should abandon that and become more dependent upon, again, the long supply chains that are, are related to fertilizers and agrochemicals is, is I think, a serious mistake. We, we shouldn't fall victim to the shock doctrine. Great. Uh, um, the, the, this question is, is to, um, to both of you. Um, and it, it, it says the rate at which agroecological practices are being promoted to rural farmers is very, very slow, albeit the fact that our present day farming practices are not sustainable and are not providing the required nutritional balance to the uh, increasing population in the world. Um, this concern is more evident in sub-Saharan Africa with its current expanding population. Um, uh, would you like to comment on that? Perhaps Laura first. <clears throat> well, I, I, it is slow, and I think most of us would like to see it accelerated. But what it really comes down to is is funding, because we know what works, and it's something that can be scaled. Uh, but at the same time, particularly for institutions like Katia, um, funding to be able to go and, and work with community organizations, to be able to work with farmers, to be able to put strategies like the CST programs in place require um, funding to do that. And there's a lack of that. And if there were more funding, I think that could, the whole process could be accelerated with great results. I think the, the good news has been, I think, in the last little while as we've seen the European Union give a much larger commitment than in the past towards agroecology, more financial support to that and more policy support for agroecology. And, and I think that's to be commended. I hope other parts of the world will do the same thing. Uh, I think we're seeing stronger moves also, particularly in West Africa, among farmers organizations and, and governments, recognizing the importance of agroecology and a different approach that, that we, we should be applauding. But uh, we also have to be asking ourselves the, the question of, of uh, how do we get from where we are? What do we build upon? Do we build upon an industrial food chain, which has for, can really ruled the roost in terms of policy in the world for the last 70 years, and which still hasn't managed to do very much. We're still after 70 years of, of policy control and enormous economic influence, only manages to really feed adequately about 30% of the world's population and very inadequately some others. And that, and that, that body can't be expected to get us from where we are to a safer place. Uh, using the same technologies and the same traditions they've used in the past, technological structures and conditions they've used in the past. We need to build upon what does work, which is a peasant system, peasant-based system of production, which is more localized, which gets right to the people and, and does the job and can be strengthened considerably through agroecology. I think that and also along with trying to bridge the gap between the agriculture agenda and the environmental agenda and, and trying to, and, and we're already seeing that where they're coming together in a number of cases and we're seeing the benefits of that. So to the extent that that could be accelerated. But by the definition, by definition, agriculture is that. It is that yeah. kind of environment <laughs> and, and yeah. social issues. Exactly. Great. I wonder, Marcos, would, would you like to make a comment at all uh, on the, the European dimension of this one? Well, as Pat just mentioned, uh, EU kind of woke up for the agroecological approach. Uh, nevertheless, the funding uh, of agroecology is still very small compared to the funding that goes to conventional agriculture. And I was just uh, discussing the other day about the subsidies that uh, we have uh, in the European Union. Right now, we are still funding much more the area and the production. And the idea that we are, are, are advocating for is that the subsidies should be directed to the promotion of ecosystem services and also to people. We don't, we, one of the ideas that we have is that the subsidies should start to be paid not based on the area that the farm has, but on the number of persons that are employed at this farm. And also which ecosystem services is this farm providing? Beyond, like obviously, 
food production is one ecosystem service, but we have a, a range of other ecosystem services that uh, farmers uh, need and want to provide, and they have to be supported in this. So there are initiatives going on definitely, but we still need to increase this dramatically. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the society is realizing more and more how important uh, this is. And I have uh, hope that it will change significantly in the coming years. Thank you. And one question, we have another discussion uh, uh, session after the next um, uh, uh, two segments. And um, uh, a question has come up, how crucial is the use of local language to the globalization of knowledge? So maybe that's something that you can be thinking about um, and we can come back to in, in the next session. But at this point, I want to move on from the framing um, and uh, to the section on integrated policies and their implementation and invite uh, Veronica Detu uh, who's head of the Climate Change Unit in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, here in Kenya. Veronica. Hello and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be in this uh, forum. And uh, what I want to do is uh, to look at uh, uh, the Kenyan situation when uh, we are looking at integrated policies and the implementation. So as I hope everybody can hear me. Sorry, I could be... Uh, no, you're yeah. very clear. Ah, thank you. Yes, so I, I'll be looking at it from the national perspective and looking at how policies could be integrated uh, or how we could look at the integration of the policies in the, and implement them to achieve uh, the goals of the Rio conventions. Next. So, of course, we are looking at the biodiversity conservation, we are looking at compacting the certification and uh, land degradation, we are looking at addressing climate change, but at the same time, we are also looking at the food uh, systems because, uh, of course, uh, the challenge is that uh, we are in the, uh, as we talk, we are still having people food insecure, we are still having the impacts of climate change and all these challenges as somebody has said in the beginning are still affecting us. Next, please. Uh, so I look at uh, the agroecology benefits in terms of uh, if we implement agroecology, what are we looking at uh, um, achieving? And we are looking at ecological circles and principles that optimize interactions between animals, human, and environment while considering the social um, benefits through uh, resource use efficiency, long-term sus sustainable productivity, uh, so that we don't just produce in, uh, in mass and then uh, we are causing problems. Uh, we are looking at improved resilience because uh, uh, we need to uh, build the resilience of the farming systems and the, uh, the farmers uh, to the impacts that affect them of climate change and others. Restoration of degraded soils because uh, uh, soils are uh, continuously getting eroded as a result of our farming systems as also a result of the climate change impacts. By promotion of biodiversity, improvement of the rural, rural livelihoods, equity and social well-being. So it is an interaction not just of the farming systems, but also of the uh, human beings, of the animals, and every uh, other system that exists. And this is supposed to lead into increased biodiversity, improved soil health, and the context-specific knowledge, traditions, enhanced food security, health, nutrition, and uh, we also address the impacts of climate change. Next, please. So, as I said, I looked at the national policies and uh, uh, how they speak to the three um, objectives of this convention, the, Rio, the convention. And uh, I looked at the climate related policies because in Kenya, there is quite a number of climate uh, uh, related policies that range from the national climate change response strategies uh, strategy, the National Adaptation Plan, the NDC, the National Climate Change Action Plans, the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture uh, Strategy and Implementation Framework, as well as the Climate Change Act, which is the legal framework uh, to address climate change in Kenya. Uh, this is among many others. 
because <clears throat> I didn't I want to analyze each project, each policy alone, I would bore you with the Kenyan policies. But uh, I also looked at the agriculture development, food and nutrition security, and these range from the Kenya Vision 2030. Uh, the agriculture sector development strategy, uh, the national uh, policy for sustainable development of the northern Kenya and other arid lands, uh, which are mainly impacted on by climate change and that are very vulnerable to uh, any other impacts. Uh, the agriculture sector strategy, uh, agriculture sector uh, transformation and growth strategy, which is uh, which is. Uh, uh, which preceded the agriculture sector development strategy, uh, and that is in implementation currently. The national livestock policy, the oceans and fisheries policy, the green economy strategy, and implementation, among many other policies that in, uh, in Kenya. And these are the ones that are not necessarily looking at the climate change, and, but they are looking at um, agricultural development and also food and nutrition security. So from this uh, analysis, the, uh, I go to the next slide where I look at how I see the integration. So the agroecology aspects in these policies, when we look at the climate change policies, of course, they to all talk about mit uh, adaptation and mitigation measures need that need to be integrated in all government planning and development objectives, of course, realizing that uh, we are very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We are looking at the issues of resilience building through management of climate risks in agricultural systems. And here is uh, we look at the agro ecosystems, the landscape, and the community-based approaches. So this uh, looks at the, all these things are looking at the or addressing in one way or another the principles of agroecology. Efficient management of soil, nutrients, water, and on farm energy resources um, uh, using proven technologies and practices for resilient livelihoods. Conservation and sustainable use of agrogenetic resources, and this has been spoken to in terms of seeds and others. Sustainable intensification of agricultural production, enhanced energy and resource efficiency, increased tree cover uh, in the uh, Kenya area, making efforts towards achieving land degradation neutral neutrality, uh, scaling up of nature-based solutions, sustainable waste management systems, drought tolerant uh, traditional high value crops, among others. Then when I came and looked at the, the, the agriculture development and food security system uh, policies, some of which I have mentioned, then you find that there is a lot of interrelation, even without looking at, I mean, going through each one of them, we are looking at uh, uh, focusing on sustainable development goals, uh, issues uh, while addressing social, and economic, and political issues, uh, looking at the water uh, management, the land cover, and all these are really related to also what the climate change uh, uh, policies are saying. We, looking at the mitigation and adaptation of course, uh, resilience, sustainable livelihoods. And then there is also the ecosystem-based sustainable uh, uh, exploitation of fisheries and other conservation issues. So for, in short, and then the issue of also equitable use of land uh, addressing environmental issues, pollution, land uh, um, uh, degradation and, and pollution, conservation and management of land based natural resources, protection and management of fragile uh, and critical ecosystems, including the wetlands and arid um, lands. So this for me is are you, really- Are you drawing to a close, uh, Veronica? Yes, sorry. Um, uh, next slide, please, I'll be done. So next slide, thank you. So when you look at uh, all the aspects of agroecology, they are contained in uh, one or two policies in, uh, that are found in Kenya. But the issue here is then uh, the problem may not really be lack of policies, but the implementation. Because like if you implement any of these policies, you will be achieving the objectives of many of the other policies. And so there is need for synergy, collaboration of the existing initiatives uh, so that we can be achieving the objectives of the three conventions. 
we also need the multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder uh, approach uh, for enhanced efficiency. Because I don't think uh, when we are, uh, because as we speak here, other people are somewhere speaking about food trade, food, talking about food systems and food, talking about uh, many other things. But uh, we need to create a meeting point. We need to be able to speak to each other so that we can uh, have an efficient and effective implementation. We also need to analyze these policies in various levels. Uh, so that we ensure that uh, we are including specific practices and we are also gaining in terms of synergy. And then of course, we need to consolidate uh, financial, technological and capacity uh, 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 issues so that we can be able to achieve sustainability. Because to me, it is uh, this, uh, most of the things is that uh, we, are, we need to move from the statements to implementation and to action at the farm level. And this needs to be really uh, brought down from the, uh, the levels at which we are discussing to the levels at the farm level, because again, there is also demand. Farmers will tend to do what uh, looks uh, possibly practical for them and they can gain immediate benefits. But then when, when we are not, uh, when we bring down the issues of how do we make these uh, gains uh, be realized by the farmers? How do we make these policies uh, implementation at the farm level? Then uh, we'll be achieving the integrated policy implementation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And it's interesting there that you were pointing to so many uh, agroecological elements in the uh, other policy domains, um, uh, rather than just agroecology policy per se. Um, can uh, I now ask uh, Elizabeth Simulton, the um, uh, policy specialist for agriculture in CEDA, um, uh, to say a, a few words from CEDA's perspective? Elizabeth. Thank you, Fergus. Um, I think we've listened to uh, very interesting messages on integrating and implementing policies and my key take home messages from these discussions are that we do need to change and we do need action. Um, we need to step up from the ground actually and I think you also you pointed out very interestingly that the action at the middle is, is where things need to, we need to meet from top down and from bottom up. For example, through national action plans. And agroecology can capture many of those solutions that we have seen here in the last presentation as well, that there are needs for more systematic approaches. So right now we're watching uh, the impacts of the war in Europe unfolding hunger and famine in other continents where there war, where, than where the war is, and in countries that could be producing food themselves. Many are still recovering from the pandemic and dealing with impacts of climate change. And these are, as Pat already pointed out, a series of connected events. They're not treated, and we shouldn't treat them as individual events. And my reflection, reflection on these ongoing initiatives to solve multiple global crises is that we quite comfortably talk about production, trade, ecosystem restoration and climate initiatives but we seem to evade one underlying cause to food insecurity, which is conflict resolution or uh, prevention and empowering local based, uh, local rights based organizations and in their capacity to uh, resolve conflicts. So CEDA's priorities are to take advantage of synergies between what we have seen today, the climate biodiversity and, and soil degradation conventions, the real conventions, in the work for sustainable economic development and prosperity of all, which is actually one of the, the headlines of this week's conferences in Stockholm Plus 50, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all is our responsibility and our opportunity. And so in doing that, I was thinking about an ABC, which was first of all, to look at the agency, strengthening and make sure the local knowledge and local capacities are part of the development process and working with local organizations to bring together the local knowledge that people have and the capacities and uh, other knowledges that they have 
to avoid conflicts and also to build up on, on their own resilience. Biological diversification, circuit, so that's the B, uh, circular processes that reduce the dependence on external inputs and contribute to agrobiodiversity and that also builds resilience to disaster. I think we've learned a lot from recovery during the pandemic where uh, economically resilient uh, areas actually were quite able to come up with small, where small scale producers were quite able to come up with quick and flexible solutions to change from what they were producing for other markets to locally, to produce locally and ensure there was food security where they came, where, where they were acting, when these value chains were broken down. And C, for context dependent, there are no ready uh, blueprints, much investment capital focuses on quick scale up, as Pat has mentioned here, with big numbers rather than long term sustainability. And this means, of course, it's easy that we build up and build in the new, all the same and new errors into the system. So, uh, Coming to a close here, I think we really need to know what causes problems and then remove them when we build back. Um, and we have an opportunity, I think, now to, to do that. When there is chaos, there is an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that um, uh, really uh, um, brought things, uh, things together. And I, I'd like to now move on to the, the section looking at, at farmers as natural system integrators. And uh, Marcus, I'd like to bring a question from the, uh, 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 the, the, the web to, to um, uh, stimulate your remarks. It's from Esther Milberg. It says, I feel uncomfortable with the constant focus, Global South as places where people need to be taught the good way. What I see, in, see here in Brazil is that even within a very difficult political context, movements, communities, and grassroots initiatives are much better at transforming their food systems through agroecology than organizations in many European countries. What can we learn in Europe from such transformations? Maybe they should be teaching us. As just mentioned, there are less policies and financial mechanism for agroecology in Europe. Uh, so with that, just to make your uh, remarks more difficult, Marcus, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fergus, and it's really a brilliant question. Uh, as a Brazilian, I, I'm also aware of this problematic, and, and this sometimes keeps me awake because we are dealing with totally different uh, totally different, not, but quite different society. And the, the struggles are different and the conditions that allow the adoption and promotion of agroecology in, in, in Brazil uh, are not found in Europe. So, but, but this also brings a very important thing related to, agri uh, to agroecology. Agroecology is not based on protocols. Agroecology is based on principles. And then the way that the principles will be deployed changes from place to place. But yeah, definitely some important patterns are that in Brazil, agroecology was only adopted because it was adopted by the social movements. And it was like social movements, academia and governments, they joined forces to promote agroecology. And they, they did exactly the same, well, okay, without the social movements, but academia and, and, and governments, they joined forces to promote the Green Revolution, and it worked. And why it should not work now to promote agroecology? And, and this is something that I always discuss a lot because, and I was talking to, to, to Pat, with Pat about this, is that uh, sometimes people say that only the private sector is the driver, should be the driving force behind these changes. But it was never like this in the past. Like the Green Revolution was, was promoted by, by the, the public sector, and it should be the same for agroecology. But then coming back to this topic as farmers, as natural systems integrators, and I will try to be very <laughs> short here, is that farmers in the society, is, uh, they, they are realizing that we are reaching the limits. Uh, when it comes to the conventional production system, we are reaching the biological limits in terms of production. So production. We cannot produce more. Even if we increase the amount of inputs, we are, we are, we are not really increasing the production anymore. So and what to do? And farmers know this, but, but farmers don't have enough possibilities or not enough support to make this transition. More and more, they have higher costs of production and lower profit. 
Uh, and they are still stimulated pre to produce more and more. There is an even lower climatic resilience or biological resilience. Pest outbreaks are a huge problem. Despite the huge amount of possibilities for chemical control, we still cannot control pests and diseases. And then obviously by the contamination uh, of the environment, we lose a lot of ecosystem services that now start to affect people living in cities too. Uh, and there's a direct uh, consequence of the simplification of cropping systems. Uh, agronomic research in the last decades uh, was only directing us to a simplification of the system. And we know that uh, nature is not simple, it's not simplified, it's complex, it's a lot of synergies. And in agriculture, we were doing exactly the opposite. And then now, and now we are realizing that, okay, we should start to learn from ecological process, from nature again on how to farm. Uh, so biological processes, instead of using external inputs to realize certain roles in the system, like nutrient provision or cycle, we can use ecological processes, mechanisms for this. Biological control is also a fantastic option. Instead of using an insecticide, a synthetic insecticide, we can start to create a system in which we have our own biological control and also a system that will not be uh, a condition that favors the past to, to develop. So Veronica uh, already presented a lot of those ideas. Uh, so how this integrated approach should look like. And I'm very happy that she mentioned principles. Again, uh, we should work based on principles and not protocols. This is a very important thing because this also implies learning. Farmers should learn how to manage their systems considering their local conditions. And this is very important. And, and consumers should also learn uh, how to consume. Yeah. Uh, and we are not really talking about this because we have to, to look at the, at the food system. Uh, I'm not looking only at the production system anymore. I, 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 we need to go beyond. We need to go beyond. And more and more people are waking up to this. And as society, we, we also need to pay more for the things that we produce. When I look at the European crop production systems, we are already very productive. Is there really a need to produce more? I think that there is a need to produce better, to increase the efficiency. The carbon footprint of our production is very high. Uh, the, the ecological footprint is enormous. We have to learn from the past, even using the green revolution experience on how to, to produce better and nature helps us a lot with a lot of knowledge and a lot of examples. Yeah. Just to, to close here and coming back again to what I mentioned before, uh, there, there are some initiatives and wishes and some ideas. Uh, in Europe, there are the subsidies, the Green Deal and, and like the cap. And these are possibilities that we have to shape our systems in a better way. Sy systems that can produce food, fiber, energy, yeah. but in a better way with nature, in com combination with nature and also with the society. And there is a lot of knowledge because farmers are out there and they are doing a lot of things. What they need is support. And we also need public support to promote this. Uh, I'm also part of Agricology Europe, which is a European Association for Agricology. And two years ago, uh, the Youth Network on Agricology uh, made a fantastic survey and they gather experiences from 11 European countries that are working with agroecology. Examples, contacts, they even uh, give the name of the, of the persons that are doing this because they want to share the knowledge. There's a farm to far, a farmer to farmer approach. And this is something that I will ask later on to share uh, here. So, so Marcus, that, that, that's a really good moment to uh, move to ask um, Monica Yato here to share her experiences um, um, uh, from, from, the, um, uh, uh, from Kenya. She's uh, um, from the Indigenous Women and Girls Initiative. Uh, Monica. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for having me here. I would like to share our experiences as Indigenous organization. Uh, we are actually doing uh, agroecology practically, that is farmer to farmer approach. And uh, why do we need agroecology now at this time of pandemic and also at this time of food crisis? 
the, the, the economy is really bad. And what happens to rural economies? Those women, indigenous women who don't afford to buy even fertilizer, as we speak now, fertilizers are very expensive, pesticides are very expensive, all, all, all impacts of climate change. But for us, we train farmers on how to make organic pesticide because we have to integrate livestock keeping and also farming. So we train uh, women how to keep, uh, uh, protect their own indigenous seeds. As you realize now, nowadays we don't have indigenous seeds. So we encourage farmers to store their own seeds for future planting. Uh, okay, and then we, we also encourage farmers to do, uh, to form groups, facilitating groups so that they can protect the environment through uh, soil health. We train them how to, uh, to test the soil. We train them how to also make a compost manure. It's very expensive now. Fertilizers are going for 8,000 to 10,000. So we're really bringing in agroecology in a practical way and in a more easy way for us to have food security in our own tables. And uh, as you know, most uh, indigenous communities are depending on livestock. But now for the integration of agroecology, we are bringing in a livelihood diversification initiative so that we don't depend so much on livestock. So when there is climate shocks, most of them die. So we go back again to zero, starting to see what are we going to do? And then for this, we reduce a lot of uh, conflicts in our communities because when we have uh, farmers now who are into, uh, integrating agroecology, they can feed their economies. We have now women having a small income to feed their, their families. That, that, and that to me is gender equality. So now we have a lot of uh, policies. I, I like what uh, Madame Veronica talked about. Yes, we have policies in papers, but do we, what do we want now? We need actions. Actions means supporting farmer groups, supporting women group, supporting even that livelihood of education initiative to enable us uh, realize these SDG goals. SDG number one, SDG number two, SDG number three, SDG number five, SDG number 13. What are we doing? What is the government doing? Who speaks for those vulnerable communities? It is us to make action now. And uh, we need to go back to bottom up as um, Mr. Faga said, we need to really listen to farmers. We need to document what farmers are doing. We need support from donors, from government to look at uh, these uh, marginalized groups. Where are they? What can we do for them? So agroecology to me is climate change resilient. It's food sovereignty. And also we need to focus on land tenure. Do we have enough land? Mm -hmm. Why are we having a corporate international grabbing our land? Who is protecting our indigenous land? Who is protecting our forest? We have a lot of forest destruction now going on. No one is, is trying to even bring initiative to, to, to restore this uh, forest. I am coming from a pastoral community, arid and semi-arid uh, area in Kenya. Nobody is speaking about dry land restoration. We are speaking about replacing forest and replacing forest. What about this dry land? What about the pastoralist community? We want also to be recognized as a livelihood. Pastoralism is viable. I am a pastoralist. I was educated by pastoralists. So pastoralism is a forgotten livelihood that we need to talk about. And of course, we can integrate agroecology and also livestock keeping. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. And you, you're getting applause here in, uh, in Nairobi, obviously speaking very um, directly um, to, to, to the audience here. Um, let's now move to Asia um, and uh, Irish uh, Bagalat from the Asian Farmers Association, uh, who's talking to us from the Philippines, um, is, is going to give us a perspective um, from Asian farmers. Irish, please. Yes, thank you, Fergus, and uh, greetings, uh, everyone from uh, Manila, Philippines. So as uh, Fergus mentioned, I am with the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, or AFA, which is an alliance of 22 national farmers federations in 16 countries with around 13 million uh, small-scale women and men producers engage in crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. So uh, before I, I give my intervention, uh, thank you to all uh, the speakers for uh, the very um, important discussion. So as, uh, as AFA, we say that beyond food production, smallholder family farmers have contributed to sustaining communities. 
we have helped, uh, for example, we have helped conserve agrobiodiversity and local knowledge and wisdom, and we have developed innovations that enabled communities to, um, to, to sustain themselves and their livelihoods. And we as farming communities have, tr have thrived with uh, agriculture practices that is intertwined with our culture. I myself is from the Ifugao tribe in the Cordillera region of the Philippines where we grow rice in terraces for rice terraces for um, decades and that our rice terraces uh, were sustained by an integrated uh, forest system that we call Muyong that we have developed for, uh, for decades. In Asia, uh, local communities rely on small scale of farmers, forest producers, fishers, herders for diverse uh, diet, uh, most uh, importantly, the local uh, communities. But despite us producing significant amount of food, in Asia, we produce uh, small holder produce about 80% of the region's food. Ironically, we are also the most affected by hunger and poverty. And also we are very much affected by climate change. And some of our members are uh, you know, living in the most degraded lands. And women farmers are affected uh, in different ways. Women, women farmers in Asia face bigger challenges when we talk about control and access to livelihood resources. And women farmers have less assets and most of the time are left out with no access to social protection. But despite all the challenges that I have mentioned, we have been adapting to the changes around us. Thus, we should be recognized as knowledge producers and solution providers. Family farmers have been implementing integrated sustainable systems, as I have um, mentioned my personal experience. And uh, some of these are uh, belong to what we call the agroecological uh, practices. And several AFA members, uh, they, they have been implementing programs and projects that have improved farm productivity, food safety, and soil health. And uh, one example in Laos in, or in Lao, our member, the Lao Farmer Network, they have trained their members in producing, processing, and labeling organic products for the market. And they have been producing promoting agroforestry uh, combined with high value and nutritious products. In Indonesia, our member, the Alliansi Petani Indonesia, or the, far, uh, the, uh, the Peasant uh, Association, is promoting farmer-led innovation, such as rice breeding. And in the Philippines, our member, the National Farmers Federation, is promoting integrated, diversified, organic farming system by training farmers which in turn train their other members. And in India, our member, they have uh, the initiative called Kamla, where they process traditional food products and are redistributed back to the communities. And our partners in the Pacific region, the Pacific Island Farmers Organization Network, they have uh, what they call the Pacific Bread, Fruit and Seeds Program. They have worked with several institutions and they were able to develop technologies around breadfruit and community-based intervention to conserve local seeds. And uh, this is their response to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So uh, we can, uh, you know, we can go on and mention several of the um, of uh, what our members and partners are doing. But what we want to, uh, to highlight here is that uh, we should be recognized as knowledge producers, as solution providers, as in the context of uh, the transition to a more agroecological uh, food systems. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that in reality, many of our members are left with no option but to you know, practice uh, conventional agriculture, which has um, which has contributed to the cycle of, of poverty. So in the context of promoting agroecology to solve many of our challenges, we recommend the following. Uh, I, we have uh, three points. So first, we need support from our gov governments for enabling environment policies that secure our rights to natural resources, mainly lands, water, forests, and seeds, and policies that incentivizes transition to agroecological approaches. And second, this is very, uh, uh, very game, uh, this is game, game changing for many of, uh, of us. Support and work with farmers organization. We recommend that you strengthen 
national and local farmers organization so they can expand their membership. When more organized and with more support from development partners, just like uh, who we have here um, uh, in today's event, these farmers organizations become more credible and trustworthy and are capable to engage in the business of overcoming hunger, poverty, and promoting agroecology and uh, sustainable food systems. And also we call on partners to support farmers cooperatives or agric agricultural cooperatives because when they are professionally managed and with dedicated leadership, they are able to um, share profits through dividends or ref patronage refunds to their members. They can provide effective economic services uh, to their members, such as loans, um, housing loans, even educational loans, and loans to um, support uh, inputs. And most importantly, cooperatives can help them engage with uh, bigger businesses and the bigger market. And uh, lastly, we call on development partners to uh, directly finance farmers through their organizations and again, cooperatives, so they can better um, respond uh, effectively and quickly to the members' uh, needs in research, innovation, extension, in, uh, in uh, post-harvest uh, systems, in capacity building, and even in uh, crisis, just like what uh, we have seen uh, during the pan pandemic. So uh, lastly, um, we, we want to say that if we are uh, fully supported, uh, we are also, uh, we are key game changers in uh, promoting uh, and scaling up agroecology uh, in our communities. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, have this intervention. Back to you, Fergus. Thank you, uh, Irish. And that was uh, um, very clear um, um, in articulating that uh, farmers and, and, and uh, civil society organizations are knowledge producers and solution providers. And I think that's one of the uh, elements that the coalition um, uh, to transform food systems through agroecology um, is uh, hoping to do in terms of reconfiguring or supporting the reconfiguration of research, education, and extension um, so that um, you can facilitate co-creation and sharing of knowledge um, uh, uh, with uh, farming communities rather than um, having power asymmetry in that, in that whole process. And the transformative partnership platform um, uh, on agroecology launched um, um, through support from Switzerland, the um, uh, Million Voices Citizen Science Campaign, which seeks to really support um, uh, civil society organizations in being the glue that links um, uh, uh, national commitments to, to local action and supports local innovation. Now, um, we have a, a huge number of questions <laughs> from, the, from the web. Um, we're not going to be able to um, uh, address uh, all of them in the time that we have, but we will um, respond to all of them uh, um, after uh, uh, the event. So anybody who has uh, asked a question, there will be some response given to it. Some, there are also um, some useful comments, and again, we'll make those available um, on the uh, TPP and the um, uh, Agroecology Coalition websites, and I'm sure Siani and others will also um, um, make them available. Um, we're, as we're getting tight on time, I want to move to an audience poll at, at this point. Um, uh, and I don't know, Fabio, whether you can put up the, but anybody who's got a mobile phone, I, I believe that's how you interact with Slido. Um, and Fabio there is uh, putting it, so you join at slido.com. And in order to access the particular poll that we're doing now, you go to hash TPP stock. And I presume that if you take a photograph of whatever of that um, uh, QR code, it also takes you there. Um, Correct. So um, please, uh, all of you, whether you're joining us online or, or in, in a room, 
uh, please get yourselves uh, um, connected to slido.com um, and put in hash TPP stock. I'm just looking around the room here to see whether uh, people are, uh, uh, are doing that. They seem to, to uh, be looking quite happy um, so in, in a general ahead? sense. <laughs> so can yeah, let, let us move on then um, to the polls. And what we've got is, is five um, issues here. Um, and what we're asking you is the extent to which um, from zero, from, from one meaning uh, not relevant um, um, to 10 being critically uh, important. And the, the first one um, uh, is that agroecology is explicitly mentioned in the text of Rio conventions uh, by the CFS Committee on World Food Security and related UN documents. How important is it um, for um, agroecology to contribute to um, integrated uh, um, uh, in, uh, implementation of, uh, uh, to, to address uh, these four interrelated global challenges? And I can see that people are voting away Things are still going uh, up and down. Um, Fabio, I, I guess you can gauge when the voting is slowing down, can you? <clears throat> yeah, uh, there's a number on top, uh, on the top right, which tells us how many people have voted. And given that in the uh, online Zoom room, we have uh, more than 250 people connected and plus the people joining us physically, I assume we will need to give them a bit more time. But yeah, votes are, are coming in. Okay, it seems that people have stopped voting. So we're gonna Good. Give, give them another 10 seconds. I'm gonna count from 10 to zero, and then we can move to the second issue. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And we're closing this one and moving to the next one. Fantastic. So there was a pattern of responses there. The next one is greater integration of policy formation and implementation across sectors e.g. food, energy, environment, water, agriculture, forestry, trade. Horizontal integration, how important is uh, design and implementation across sectors or actions to make it happen, I guess. And again, people are voting away. A different pattern emerging um, in this case looks to me that there's a higher proportion of people who think this is more important than what's written in the Rio conventions. Maybe not hugely surprising, but still um, uh, significant and important. Uh, and, and we might want to think about how much resources go into these different areas as we um, um, think about um, the importance of, of different types of action. Are we about there with that one, Fabio? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. We had 80 votes uh, for the first one. We're uh, around 85 here. So I'm going to count from five down. Five, four, three, two, one. So make your vote because we're, we're moving on to the third issue. Over. So the third is, is about vertical integration, greater integration of policy implementation across scales, international, national, subnational, and local, including addressing the lack of policy structures and social capital at local landscape or territorial scales. I think in the French speaking world, people tend to talk about uh, territory um, uh, quite often uh, in the English speaking world, it's, it's landscape. So whatever your preference. Um, and again, a different 
pattern emerging here. Um, and interestingly, the scale issue seems to be um, less important than the cross-sectoral um, in, in terms of people's uh, uh, opinions, although voting is still going on. We can see these bars going up and down. Okay, so we're gonna yep. do the counter back. Five, yep. four, three, two, one, and we move to the next issue. And there's only two more to go. So uh, um, this one is reducing power asymmetry in food systems to avoid vested interests of those pursuing the currently predominant industrial model of agricultural production from resisting food system transformation. And perhaps reflecting an agroecology um, uh, based audience, this one seems to so far be the one that has received the highest uh, uh, level of, of importance. And of course, that, that's in itself a potential difficulty, because if we're only talking to each other, rather than talking to um, the, the vested interests that we want to change, then, then that could be uh, problematic. Do you want to count down on that one? Um, yep, yep. We're almost there. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, make your vote. And that's very stark. Nearly everybody who voted thought it was critically exactly. important. And then the, the final one is increasing the agency of small scale farmers, including pastoralists and fisher folk and food consumers in being able to express their preferences about how food is produced, processed, stored, transported, sold, and consumed. And again, um, uh, this one is receiving a large proportion, although not quite as clear as, as for power asymmetry, but uh, a, a lot of people uh, thinking it is uh, very important. So Fabio, do you want to count down? Yep. So last chance to cast your vote. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to lock this. Okay, here we go. All right. So. Okay, and we will make those results available with the uh, the whole sort of uh, uh, transcript uh, on and, and information about the event, so you will be able to um, access it. And I think it's quite a useful thing um, for us to have seen. Now we were going to have closing remarks from Philip Asano of um, the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, who's normally here in Nairobi, but is actually in Stockholm, but I understand that he hasn't managed to uh, get to the uh, the venue in Stockholm. I is that right, uh, Stockholm? Yes, that's right. Unfortunately. So I think, um, uh, being as we're, we're beyond time, um, we probably need to wrap up the, the, the meeting. I'm sure you'll all continue discussing these issues in Stockholm, in, uh, here in Nairobi, and amongst all of you who uh, um, have joined uh, online. Um, I think this is very much the beginning of a discussion, and I can see that there's a real need to move from the talking to the action. Um, that seems to be uh, very much on everybody's uh, lips. Uh, and, I, and I hope that we can, and that the uh, this new coalition will really begin doing things on the ground and helping get national and local transitions uh, moving. Um, with that, I'd like to thank everybody, um, particularly those who made an effort to come to the two venues. It's a strange situation that we're in these days, having been used to uh, uh, you know, the COVID conditions in which we couldn't um, um, meet together. It's actually really wonderful to have people 
here in the room in Nairobi to see people uh, having traveled to, to Stockholm and be able to interact. So thank you very much. And thanks all of those online and particularly all of those who've made uh, presentations today. I know it's difficult. You get a short amount of time in, in these sort of contexts, but I think it's been very rich. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all uh, uh, very much indeed for taking part. And with that, we will close the webinar.